live Zoom with uh, the UN climate change high level champion from Egypt, Mahmoud Mohildin. And then finally, a uh, uh, brief chat with Salish Singal, the founder of Youth for Green Hydrogen, and then uh, Ninka Homan uh, from the Netherlands, who's one of the GH2 directors, will uh, introduce the green hydrogen message for COP27. And at that point, we will uh, all celebrate, I hope, uh, what I believe has been a very, very successful uh, conference. So I want to, before I, we go to the uh, video with John Kerry, I want to thank, make us say a few uh, thanks. I want to thank the Spanish government for co-hosting this uh, assembly. And of course, the Deputy Prime Minister, Teresa Ribera, was here yesterday uh, in showing great enthusiasm, uh, both uh, on, the, on the platform and uh, on the stage. Um, I want to thank our principal assembly partners, uh, first and foremost, Fortescue Future Industries, uh, and whose who's, uh, founder, Andrew Forrest, is here with us, of course, as he's been every day, Korea Zinc uh, and Arc Energy, whose chief executive, Yun Choi, is, uh, is with us, uh, as, and but they've made a great contribution. And also our assembly partners, Tissen Krupp, Hyundai, Adani, and H2 Green Steel. Without you, we wouldn't have been able to uh, bring this uh, conference together. And uh, I just want to thank you for that. I also, if I may, as chairman of Green Hydrogen Organization, and unlike Fortescue Future Industries, where the chairman is absolutely hands-on, I am uh, I'm, uh, sort of more supervisory, I would say, uh, at a high level, but I really want to thank the uh, team of the Green Hydrogen Organization, uh, led by our chief executive, uh, Jonas Moberg, who's done a, done a fantastic job putting this together. So, so there he is. He's good. He's, uh, he, is a, he is a climate champion himself. Uh, so now, last night, as I said, I uh, had a discussion with John Kerry uh, over Zoom, and we recorded it, and hopefully... Uh, it will now play. Thank you so much for joining us, John. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see you again. Uh, we're halfway between COP26 and COP27. Uh, so it's, it's half time. What's the score? How are we going? Uh, our team is fighting genuinely in most cases playing hard, but uh, we're not winning the game yet. And uh, it's hard to say, I can't quantify how many goals behind we are, but to use your analogy, but we're behind. And, and uh, the potential of catastrophe of so sort of losing our position in the top flight is real here. We are, um, you know, we've made big promises in Glasgow. They are achievable, but unfortunately, we're not pushing hard enough globally to actually achieve them. And uh, you know, emissions went up last year. Uh, the use of fossil fuels went up last year. Coal use went up last year. That is not the right trend line by any sense of the imagination. And I am hearing people regrettably use a Ukraine where we are all united in our efforts to uh, support uh, the very courageous folks in Ukraine against uh, their, the, the um, unbelievably egregious, unprovoked attacks from Vladimir Putin. But nevertheless, we have to stay focused on climate, which is also an existential crisis, even though obviously seeing the bad sides it's, it's further out. It doesn't have the immediacy of some of these other challenges. It was, it's not that much further out. I mean, there was when, when you were first talking about global warming uh, uh, well over 20 years ago, it did seem a long way off, but the really terrible consequences of global warming, which we're seeing now in the physical world, are in the here and now, aren't they? Yes, they are. And the consequences are growing worse and worse. And it, it's so palpable now that 
you have to really be pursuing the ostrich policy where you put your head in the sand and mm. pretend it's not going on. Uh, John, I, I'm here in Barcelona at the Green Hydrogen Assembly. Uh, great collection of leaders from business, government, civil society around the world focused on the green hydrogen agenda. Uh, I know that you're excited about the potential for green hydrogen to play its part in the transition to a zero emission energy world. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the state of play with green hydrogen? And in particular, uh, how do you think governments are, are governments providing adequate support for it from a policy and, and uh, you know, incentives point of view? Well, I think uh, obviously green hydrogen, clean hydrogen is uh, very much sought after at this point in time and governments all around the world are talking the hydrogen game. Uh, I don't think I've been to any country that doesn't voluntarily put forward the possibilities of green hydrogen and that they're pursuing it. Um, and that rain, you know, all around the world, literally. Uh, where we are today, I think is making progress. Uh, it, the price per kilogram was, you know, upwards of 10 or more, not so long ago, down to about 4.55. Uh, and um, obviously the, the, the goal is to get it down to $1 or less if possible, as soon as possible. I think a great progress is being made on the uh, scaling of electrolyzers and of the production itself. Uh, and I think that will continue. Uh, could we do more? Yes, I think we need a number of Manhattan projects around the world. As you know, the Energy Department has embraced green hydrogen within its moonshot program. Um, we're putting billions on the table, as are others. And that helps me to feel you know, some sense of optimism that we're going to get where we need to go with hydrogen, which is going to be great for long haul trucks, for aviation, for shipping. I think there's certain places. You notice one major auto dealer sort of pulled out of the hydrogen passenger car concept and is going electric as I think most are, but um, hydrogen is gonna play just a huge role. And as it gets cheaper, as it comes online and, and to scale uh, and particularly becomes clean hydrogen. And there is a distinction, obviously, you're all aware. Um, you know, it's one thing to have green hydrogen where the hydrogen itself is green and, and emissionless. Uh, it's another thing to be producing it up and, si up and down the value chain with everything being green that, that comes into contact yeah. with it. And that's obviously our goal. Uh, and I congratulate the hydrogen uh, you know, council that Andrew Forrest has helped pull together, which I think is a very, very, I mean, this is really gaining momentum. And yeah. that's what we need. That's what we need. So well, I feel sure. quite yeah. I, yeah, it, it sure is, John. You know, today uh, in Barcelona, we uh, set out a green hydrogen standard, and uh, for, you know, because we because we've got to agree on what green hydrogen is. I mean, absolutely, it's not a label that people should be able to stick on any sort of hydrogen they like. Uh, and so, what we're saying is that green hydrogen is hydrogen made by electrolyzing water with renewable electricity, with with you know little or no uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of other uh, sort of uh, standards in terms of sustainability and social commitments and uh, that are that are related to it. But that the right at the fundamental core is what we're saying is, you know, the, the guys in the fossil fuel sector can call there, if they want to do hydrogen with carbon capture and storage, they can call it whatever they like, but it isn't green hydrogen, green hydrogen is made with renewables. Yes, right on target. Yeah. Uh, that's and I congratulate. I think coming up with a standard is really important, and that's going to have a global impact. So thank you very much, any and all of you who are involved in that. That's that's a great yeah. step forward. We've had one of your one of the. I, you know, I was at, at Glasgow, of course, like you were, and I was really uh, impressed with the way in which you brought together a coalition of business leaders. In fact, in some respects, the business leaders were providing more leadership than some of the politicians, but we probably shouldn't labor that point. But the- That's All right, you're, 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 like, you're also a recovering politician. So. <laughs> That's right, exactly. We're still getting over it, still twitching. Yeah. Uh, 
But Martina Mertz, who you, you, you've met, you know, well, of course, is the chief executive of ThyssenKrupp, the huge German steelmaker. Uh, she's making the point today that, that for every kilogram of hydrogen used to make green steel saves 26 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So, you know, green steel uh, is, a, is, ob is absolutely doable. It's being made, it's just got to be scaled up and that'll take time. But the savings, given that steel making, as you know, is 9% of global emissions, if we can decarbonize steel, and we can with green hydrogen, what an extraordinary transformation that will be and what a dent that will make in our global emissions. Yes, sir. You are 100% correct as, again. And, and it's one of the things that really does excite me. We're, you know, we created this entity in uh, Glasgow, or ahead of Glasgow, actually. We announced it, so did the launch in, in Glasgow. But in partnership with the uh, World Economic Forum, we, uh, we put together uh, the First Movers Coalition. And it's a group of businesses, you know, more, almost 40 now, uh, worth nine or so trillion dollars in assets managed. And they all agreed they were gonna take the lead in creating the demand for the markets. And one of the areas where they did it, I mean, they've done it in several areas. Maersk announced they're gonna, the next eight ships they build are gonna be carbon free. Volvo announced the next, that all the cars they manufacture will now, they'll buy 10% of the steel for those cars will be green steel. And they're buying it from a green steel producer in Sweden, but there will yeah. be more because there's a market there. And um, uh, I think that the uh, same thing's happening with cement and so forth. So hydrogen, uh, I think, is going to help accelerate that process. As you know, you have to burn very high degrees temperature to be able to do some of these industrial processes. And uh, so it's going to be important to be able to have a fuel that can, in fact, reach those temperatures and produce the green products that we need. I think this is all going to accelerate very significantly. We hope to have and will have some major company announcements of joining this first movers coalition. But it's very encouraging to me that people believe enough in this transformation and in the, the transition to the clean energy marketplace that they're willing to pay a slight premium now to help create the demand to move in that direction. Yeah, but that is the future. That is the future. Indeed. Can, can I just uh, ask you uh, about uh, uh, renewable electricity overall? I mean, we ob obviously in, in developed economies like the United States or Australia or most European economies, we have been used to, uh, you know, uh, growing economies, but with fairly stable, sometimes even declining rates of electricity consumption, because a lot of heavy manufacturing has moved to other jurisdictions and also you know, new appliances and machines are more energy efficient. <clears throat> Developing countries, on the other hand, and you've shown great empathy in the way you've negotiated with them and dealt with them, have got to decarbonize and at the same time increase their electricity production because so many of their citizens don't have enough. We're now in the situation, though, where the table has turned somewhat because we are going to need to have, some people would estimate, five times as much electricity by 2050, as we do today, in order to not just meet the demands of people in the developing world, but more, you know, more massively, the demands of creating uh, green hydrogen and the demands of electrification. I mean, how do you, given that so much of the uh, equipment, the wherewithal of renewable energy uh, is, is made in China and, and overwhelmingly in China, do you think that we're in a position to move the manufacture of solar panels, wind turbines, you know, wind turbine blades, all of the kit associated with renewable generation. Do you think we're in a position to move that so that it's spread? Not, to, I'm not to suggesting taking it out of China, but so we're going to need so much more. We're going to have to be doing it everywhere. Do you think we can do that? Do you think we can yes. get back into manufacturing? I have no doubt about it. Absolutely. Of course we can. And I think countries, 
frankly need to take the steps to make sure that we do that, Malcolm. I mean, for heaven's sakes, why are we in 2022 subsidizing the creators of the problem, which is unabated fossil fuel? Why are we subsidizing that over the last five years? Two and a half trillion dollars. Last year, $440 billion. Mm. And not subsidizing the creation of these supply chains that we know we need in order to provide clean energy. It just doesn't make sense. It, it's insane. And, and we've got to move more aggressively, all of us, in our country and everywhere else, to shift the incentives to some degree. Now, even without that, we can help develop and shift this supply chain to some degree. Prime Minister Modi, for instance, is very intent, and they are helping now to develop uh, a, a manufacturing base for solar panels in India. This will happen and can happen in other parts of the world without any doubt whatsoever. Uh, and again, and I agree with you, we're not, we're not overtly trying to strip it away from China and say, you can't have it. They, they will do it. They are the world's largest producer of renewables today. And they are also the world's largest deployer of renewables today. Mm. But because they're such a huge country, uh, you know, these things mitigate a little bit uh, in terms of the, their impact because China happens to also be the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gas, you know, greenhouse gases. And so China bears actually a very shared significant res responsibility here to step up and begin to transition away from coal to other sources. Now, you raise a very important point. We've got to be developing the base of electricity even faster because the demands on it will be even greater. And I mean, just charging cars, let alone producing clean electricity for public transportation, for manufacturing and so forth, let alone you know, heating homes. So um, heating and lighting homes. So how are we gonna do that? Well, I think we have to pursue right now a host of possibilities. Hydrogen is one, but fusion is another. And, and there are those involved in the research on fusion who have been there for a long time. You know how the old saying is, fusion's always 30 years, okay, 30 years down the road. For the first time in my life, I have heard serious people tell me that that is not the equation today and they think we're moving faster. But even if you don't accept that, uh, you, you've got the possibility of a next generation of nuclear plants. Well, there's no, there's no question, uh, John, that we, we have the tool, the technology will get better, of course, but we have the tools to do the job now. We've got renewables cheaper than ever. We've got long duration storage, pumped hydro, is an oldie but a goodie and we're doing more of it. Batteries yeah. are getting better. And of course, we've now got the big game changer of green hydrogen that will decarbonize all those places that are hard to electrify. So that's what Absolutely. we've been on about today. And I just want to thank you for your leadership and for the time you've spent with us today and uh, wish you all the best in your endeavors. You're, uh, you are, uh, you're really, uh, well, America is back, as President Biden said, and uh, John Kerry is back. And so hope in uh, combating climate change is back too. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. Take care of yourself and thank you all at this conference. Thank Critical you. work. Thanks, thank John. You. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, John Kerry. Uh, now, can I ask uh, the our friend from Indonesia, Arifin Tasrif, to come and join me? And uh, we're going to have a, and I'd also ask uh, Salesh Singhal to come up. Perhaps if you could, perhaps you could sit here, uh, Excellency. And uh, Salesh, why don't you sit there next to the minister? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I think that, I'll, I'll, I'll just pose a question to you and, and I can give you the microphone, but uh, the, uh, uh, as the Indonesia's Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources, what role do you see for the G20, which will be held in, in the next one will be held in Indonesia in advancing the green hydrogen agenda? Thank you, Excellency uh, Malcolm Turnbull. That, uh, we know that to achieve the SDGs and to achieve the target of net zero emission, we as a G20 host, 
we in the in the energy transition working group we set three priorities one is accessibility second technology the third is the finance itself and next month by next month by next month we will have the second uh, second working group uh, meetings in Labuan Bajo where we work together with Irina that we promote the webinar regarding accelerating hydrogen and energy storage development. We know that uh, hydrogen is very important to achieve, uh, to achieve this, uh, uh, our net zero emission target. We already prepare our roadmap uh, for Indonesia itself. Uh, by 2060 that we will reach the net, uh, net zero emission. So that's why we are very eager yeah, to put more, uh, more, uh, more weight yeah, about the green hydrogen in the discussion uh, to, to achieve such kind of uh, uh, agreement in the community in the ministerial meeting and then also in the presidency. Thank you. No, well, since that, that, thank you very much. Perhaps if you can give one to the minister. There you go. Right, so we need one each. Um, so do you think, uh, I mean, green hydrogen has, uh, you know, it's had a, a it's had been mentioned uh, in previous uh, G20s, but uh, do you think you're going to be in a position or you will in Indonesia, do you think it will be actually put up there in bright lights as a headline issue? Well, uh, well, we we know how important hydrogen yeah, to 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 replace yeah, to to remove the CO two emission itself. And Indonesia, we have uh, many. We have uh, plenty. We have uh, big sources of uh, renewable energy that we clean and renewable energy that we can produce green hydrogen. Mm. So uh, we are right now carrying the small pilot plan in the one of the area that how to produce hydrogen by using the solar combination with the micro hydro. And then uh, in the, we also thinking about to produce hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen coming from our existing hydropower plant, mm. yeah, which is uh, already amortized that we can uh, produce uh, low cost electricity in, uh, in order to make the hydrogen uh, economic. But one important thing is that we have to find the consumer itself. We have to have such kind of uh, industrial target. So we are thinking about specific uh, utilization of hydrogen in a such a spot of industrial areas by using our existing uh, electric uh, electrical uh, producer. Right, this is PLN. PLN? Yeah, right, right. okay. Well that, well, that is terrific. You, you mentioned these uh, old hydro plants uh, that you can, you think you can use, you'll use in, in West Java, I, I think you said. Yes, right. That's right, yeah, to yeah. Uh, generate, to make hydrogen that they were uh, built in the 60s with assistance from the Russians. Yes. <laughs> well, that, that would be yeah. quite, quite, well, that would be it's, quite it's good. It's already amortized. Yeah. So I think the cost is what we can, we, what we have to do is how do we refurbish and then we get an excess capacity so mm. we can still have the balance between the existing consumer and the new consumer, which is uh, to produce green hydrogen. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, excellency. Um, that's, uh, well, Indonesia is, uh, is actually key to the climate challenge, both in terms of generating uh, renewable electricity and of course with forests that are, you know, together with uh, uh, Central Africa and, and uh, Brazil represent really the lungs of the earth. So it's, uh, uh, we look forward to that. And uh, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your support and please give all of our best wishes to the president. Now, um, Let's, um, let, yeah, thank you. Very good. Now, uh, are we ready to uh, uh, connect uh, uh, His Excellency in Egypt? That, right, okay. Well, oh, there he is. Excellency. Hi, just call me Mahmoud. Um, Mahmoud, well, I, that's right. You're looking, 
you're looking, you've got a great camera, you are in the highest of high definition, and you're looking as cheerful. You, the only thing that would make you more cheerful is if you'd been with us and having fun exactly. here I'm, in Barcelona for two days. In the great city of Gaudi and uh, the great people of Barcelona. I miss that. Yeah, that's great. So, so um, the Mark Wood, the, the next uh, COP, of course, is going to be in Egypt, in Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, what role do you think green hydrogen will be playing in the deliberations and negotiations and conclusions of the COP27 in Egypt? Right. So, uh, let, let me first thank, thank you and congratulate you all for what you reached. Um, reaching a standard on green hydrogen is a great achievement. I know it's a result of hard work, serious partnership between all of the players in this critical field, um, especially the, um, the uh, leaders from the business community and the good um, uh, work with governments and regulators and think tanks and research centers. So we may take many things as given, but I know what kind of hard work uh, that had been behind you. And uh, now we have the standard, let's apply it. Uh, That's the first thing I'd like to share with you. The, the second, uh, we, which is very much related to what we heard now from you and the Honorable Minister from Indonesia, wishing him and uh, my good sister Sri Mulyani all the best for um, uh, the coming weeks and hosting the G20 and of course for the President of Indonesia and your uh, fantastic chat with uh, Secretary Kerry. I think the first thing that comes to mind uh, when we talk about COP27 Egypt is basically about a holistic approach to climate because you rightly mentioned something about, yes, we have the technology, we have the science. Now we have something new that was not there. Nobody was talking about it, but how can we use it in order to create jobs? How can we use it in order to solve the problems of people around the world after being exposed to major uh, crises uh, after the pandemic? And how to deal with it? I was just yesterday in Kenya before arriving here today in Cairo. That's why I couldn't really come to this to your meeting with the Afri, uh, Afri cities. Um, thousands um, were in, um, in, in the meeting yesterday, and you will be happy to know that issues related to energy, renewable energy, and solutions were at the top of the agenda of the discussion and were among the top um, 10 points raised by the president of Kenya, President Kenyatta, when he spoke about energy and the solution. He's very mu much right on that because we're talking about a continent with 600 billion, half of the population are without electricity. Uh, I wish all the best for all cities in the world, but imagine life in Barcelona, 50% without access to electricity, even for a very, very short period of time. But this is a kind of constant state in many developing countries in Africa and great that green hydrogen is becoming part of the solution, thanks to the scientists, science, uh, thanks to the investments in research, and development. So this is the first thing in the holistic approach that Egypt is, um, is embracing. The second thing related to your earlier discussion, which I enjoyed a lot, uh, congratulations for that, is basically about implementation. As Secretary Kerry mentioned, we, there are many pledges, great stuff, great words have been um, uh, mentioned of appreciation of what we should be doing, great concerns as well that we're doing very little. There was a report that just came out today and the Secretary General issued of the United Nations issued a piece on it, the WMO State of Global Climate. I, I encourage you all to read it because all of the solutions about new energy solutions and renewable energy, and it's very much linked to green hydrogen to your point. So it's basically about implementation, how to invest, not to translate the summits into solutions, to get into projectizing all of these claims and pledges that we have been doing. We need more projects. You would tell me that in Africa, for instance, Egypt, we have been signing a lot of MOUs, great stuff during the last few weeks. I think in Egypt alone, there were five or six serious MOUs between private sector partners and government of Egypt and different authorities. What is missing? I'm relying on your network here. We need offtake agreements because the technology is there, the solution is there, the funding is being ready, but we need really those who are going to be demanding the output of the green hydrogen. I would say the clean green hydrogen 
or the green hydrogen as you put it in your standard, but we need offtake agreement, including um, perhaps in Europe, where one of the commissioners of the EU said that Europe cannot be self-sufficient in green hydrogen, and the only solution to that is partnership. So your southern Mediterranean part is ready. Africa is ready for some good solutions in this front with investment and technologies that come from the US, from Australia. This is one of the, um, uh, of the companies that signed recently in Egypt, um, a big name, uh, Fortescue. And then uh, we have other partnerships from Europe, from Nordic countries, from the Gulf. But this is, will be uh, another thought. The, the third, and very quickly, is about finance. How can we mobilize finance to support all of that? Less debt, more investment. Because countries in the South, in the emerging world, have enough of debt. As much as we can do more private um, equity participation, more partnerships, that will be great. Number four is regionalization. Some of the issues, including projects, the big, uh, big projects in green hydrogen require this kind of regional dimension, including securing the, uh, uh, the raw material in the supply uh, chain. And the, and the fifth aspect and the final one is basically about localizing the climate agenda and providing solutions to where it matters, to the ordinary people who have been missing a lot, not just because of crisis. We cannot put everything on the hanger of crises, Ukraine and, and, and Corona. We had problems even before then, and we need to, to, to provide solutions in this upcoming summit um, providing solutions to those who are wondering why we're meeting, why we have these COPs, and it's basically for them and for the planet at the end, but they need really to feel that in terms of good, decent projects that would transform their lives to the better. Good. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we um, now uh, have uh, some words from uh, Salesh Singhal, who's the founder of Youth for Green Hydrogen, and Salesh, I was going to ask you, uh, we talk a lot about working to safeguard future generations. Um, we haven't done a great job, my generation, so far, but uh, we, we are trying to mend our ways. Um, we should really talk less and listen more. So tell us about your work on the role of youth in advancing the green hydrogen agenda. But what messages do you have right. for your elders, if not betters? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh... Prime Minister Turnbull, for your thoughts and for engaging young people. What I really understand is that I would first like to express my sincerest gratitude to the Secretariat of Green Hydrogen Organization and, of course, especially Eric, on having me and youth voices here. I think what is really essential is when we go back to the past, a very uh, study or by OACD suggests that how important young people are in the engagement of any activities, especially in the transition of green energy. And three of them, which is very essential by that report suggests that young people are not just the present of the country, but are also profoundly affecting the future of any country. Second, young people are at a stage in life characterized by a high capacity to learn and acquire skills and in general have a positive skill set towards participation in society. Having said that, I remember while I was part of the C20 plan op opening session where of course Honorable Minister had his uh, remarks and his thoughts on engagement of youth made me believe that this year's G20's presidencies lies in the hands of youth centric leadership. So thank you so much, Minister, for that. Of course, the third, which is very crucial when we go back to the OECD report, suggests that we need to invest in young people because investing in young people has intergenerational benefits that can create powerful agents for change. To answer what you asked, um, of course, uh, we believe that this generation was making a mistake. And there's a report suggesting uh, by the University of Bath conducted over 10 countries. But now I look at differently. And young people across the world are looking at differently. Because it is this generation again with intergenerational partnerships that have brought green hydrogen into the picture. And it is forerunners like Fortescue. It is forerunners like Adani, Tyson Krupp that have again engaged youth leadership and into green hydrogen. So I think we don't blame you anymore. 
now we rather say that engagement of you young leadership in green hydrogen has really inspired and made us more believe in you just coming back from the youth working group to share with all of you it is my humble opportunity to tell that here dr andrew suggested advised from the working group that we came out from that this youth for green hydrogen which was of course launched somewhere in the foothills of himalayas endorsing it here he said that from here we go to united nations and from united nations we go to cop 27 and i think that is the big message that we all have in this green hydrogen assembly that today we do something but what next and his endorsement has made us believe young people across the globe that that can happen yesterday when dr arun uh, a very learned scholar talked about demand i believe this is 18% of youth population of my age of course i believe in the senior youth and all of you who are sitting here in the intergenerational partnerships but it is the 20% of the 18 to 20% of the population who is going to create that demand and when we said that in the university of birth survey report that we are angry but we also said that we are ready for the energy transition and if we said that rightly this 20% of the population if given a very clear transparency and made understood that green hydrogen is one of those fuel of the world or the fuel of the future which will help us achieve 1.5 degree celsius and net zero emissions i am assured that all of us sitting here all the young people across the globe would suggest that i am ready to take it up and talking about you know uh, about the mistakes i mean somehow of course if you would have asked me in 2020 i would have stood strongly with greta and told that it is you who is making the mistake but again i come here and suggest that now no the mistakes are being recorrected because this is exactly what happened with the recent government in india of course led by the architect of green india prime minister narendra modi has steered the youth of india into motivating to become vocal for local and then taking it global and by creating that ecosystem of demand and supply which was shared by the young dynamic entrepreneur vinith mithal as well yesterday so uh, you know just getting towards the thoughts of how we all came together prime minister your works uh, on the path program somehow is inspiring where you skilled more than 100000 young people and provided them the jobs so i think we could have a big round of applause for you for engaging youth leadership into the jobs as well so thank you so much press time is very kind thank you of course there is something that uh, i want to thank of course uh, ravi and our dear friend eric and mentor in enabling youth voices and that is exactly how may i take this opportunity in presenting the world's first youth declaration on youth hydrogen to everyone this is the first declaration that got passed i mean i don't have the copies any oh, thank you thank you well th thank you very much thank you of course the declaration key messages are very clear investing in youth leadership in creating awareness on green hydrogen on an entrepreneurship creating a global task force of young women and men to work closely on green hydrogen develop initiatives to build capacity of young people to participate and promote a culture of green hydrogen nestle youth led innovation to localize the production and usage of green hydrogen by making it economical and accessible for all strengthening women leadership in green hydrogen at local to global levels supporting and including marginalized and indigenous youth in green hydrogen initiatives and creating a global green hydrogen fund to encourage youth led initiatives to rapidly increase the support for green hydrogen production and use in countries and emerging markets but there is more and that is we from the historic session of green hydrogen assembly urge the government to propose a resolution in the united nations general assembly to call for a green hydro world green hydrogen day which would be the first in its kind to say so of course there are uh, uh, copies that have been distributed 
people who support it please sign it off these are the papers which are being made by the leftover fodder and recycled papers very good well thank you sally thank you so much uh, president uh, prime minister and in just the end you know yep. uh, of course uh, the ancient sages have said tamso mas jyotimar sudhir gaya meaning from darkness lead me into the light and in literal sense it is a journey from gray to green yeah. and we need innovation like fortescue where even emissions could be used to create green clean water and oxygen you could go to the exhibition center and enjoy the clean oxygen for yourself i think that leadership is exactly what is needed and we as young people are ready to come together in marching of what it is said yesterday from here we march on and i'm from here we run as suggested by dr andrew we are ready to be part of the green history with folded hands namaste green hydrogen uh oh, thank you that was a that is a uh, that that thank you salish that is a great speech and and looking at the signatures i can see that it's not just people who are young in years but also some who are young at heart the intergenerational partnership that is that's that is just, that's very good so so we could sign this ourselves actually yeah we 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 young at heart perhaps not young in years now well thank you now i'm now going to ask uh ninka homan president of the sustainable hydrogen club uh and together with her and and Jonas uh to introduce the green hydrogen message for COP27. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, it feels like the last minute. It is the last minute. So, a 1 minute short summary. Uh here's a 1 minute summary of the proposed message from all of us to COP27. Because while the intergovernmental panel on climate change says it is now or never the actual message is the time is now because we don't want a climate disaster green hydrogen needs to play a prominent role in our decarbonized energy system if we want to successfully prevent a climate disaster and to have a clear and significant impact at least 100 million tons of green hydrogen need to be produced at 2030 to make this happen cop 27 the world needs to price carbon emissions and eliminate the subsidization of fossil fuels ensure a rapid expansion of renewable energy capacity set ambitious demand targets by 2030 make smart use of production tax credits contracts for difference public procurement targets and other incentives provide concessionary funding guarantees and risk alleviation invest in infrastructure and pilot projects for renewable energy and transportation have government procurement policies and practices giving strong preference to renewable energy and green hydrogen and spurring the use of green hydrogen in the hardest to electrify sectors apply globally recognized standards and certification schemes promoting equity and contribution to the sustainable development goals and support and expand multilateral approaches like the Africa Green Hydrogen Alliance. Of course, invest in youth. And that's the message also online to make it happen. Please share the message. The time is now. Well, thank you very much, Nika. I want to thank everybody for their contribution to this uh, uh, green hydrogen assembly uh, that now brings an end to our proceedings, but it doesn't bring an end to our work. So we have to go forward from here safely back to our homes. Uh, and I wish you all a safe travels back to, to where you live. But above all, we have to get on with this job. The challenge is there. We have every resource, all of the technologies, all of the enthusiasm, all of the the resources we need except one and that is time so the time is now we have to do it green hydrogen will be the key to saving this planet thank you very much